Hi, everybody. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the very bizarre history of the Lion of Gripsome Castle. So let's take a trip to Gripsome Castle, right? So it's towering, just powerful and fairy tale like at the small lakeside town, you know, built in the 14th century. I mean, we wish we could all be here right now. It has all the really cool old timey castle stuff, like dungeons, armories, cannons, and a hallway full of paintings of old guys whose eyes follow you down long and winding corridors. And at the very end of this hallway is this most extraordinary stuffed lion. His name is Leo, and he didn't always look this way. He was very much alive and beautiful when he arrived to the castle at some point in the 1700s. And Leo arrived to the castle by ship, of course, as part of a treaty between King Frederick I and the ruler of Algiers. The king presented jewelry, weapons, ammunition, and fine cloth to the ruler. And the ruler, in return, gave him two live lions, one of which is Leo, a wild cat, three hyenas, and a caretaker for all of these animals. And these trade agreements secured free passages of the ships through foreign waters and protection from pirates and all that, all that good stuff. So Leo came to live in this royal game park. Um, previously, there had been deer, elk, reindeer, um, all sorts of, you know, mystical woodland creatures. But now here was Leo and his buddy um, and a whole bunch of other exotic animals. So there's not really a lot documented about Leo's life, but we can infer a few things. Um, much like my cat who shits the bed when I start vacuuming, cats are really prone to stress. So I think Leo probably didn't like the stress of being on a long ship ride and the shock of, you know, reaching the strange new world at this habitat that's completely unlike the one he came from. So I don't think he had a very, very long, um, I don't think he had a very long life. But clearly he was loved, um, even in a very misguided way, because the king wanted Leo preserved by taxidermy after he passed away. Um, and taxidermy is a long and laborious process. It's not cheap and it doesn't take a short amount of time. So this is all a labor of lots of love. And by the time Leo died, all that was left were his pelt and some bones. There was no walk-in freezer to keep him whole and frozen. Certainly no reference casts or carcass measurements were taken. So, you know, just giving the, giving the taxidermist a bunch of bones and his skin, what could possibly go wrong, right? And a lot of people ask, why did they wait so long? I'm not sure, but this quote here, under the reign of King Frederick, science has developed, he never bothered to read a book. The merchant business has flourished, he has never encouraged it with a single coin. The Stockholm Palace has been built, he has never been curious enough to look at it. So that gives us a little insight to that he might have been a little lazy, a little ignorant, and just might not have known any better. And um, that was actually a post-mortem quote, so it's a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty sick burn. Um, and in the 18th century, taxidermy was just beginning to resemble what we know of it today. So it's a process where a preserved skin is mounted over a sculpted form, um, and today taxidermists have access to all sorts of like amazing sculpting materials, even 3D printing and 3D scanning. But back then they didn't have all of this. It was mostly clay and mache and plaster. Um, and you know, especially now we have like all this visual and scientific reference, like even Google Images is amazing. Um, but they didn't have that back then. What they did have were wire and wood wool or straw or cotton and things that they stuffed, um, things that they literally stuffed pelts with. Um, here we can see how widely the quality varied. Um, the upper example shows a very anatomically accurate form that was made with a ton of care. The lower examples, which are actually x-rays, show how these animals were just wired with just stuffing all around them. Um, so, you know, results, results really did vary. And how many people in Europe had even seen a lion before? They didn't have the knowledge and expertise of seeing a lion, you know, face to face, seeing it a lot, especially not, um, you know, especially not seeing it regularly since it wasn't native to native to Europe. So they look more like the heraldic, stylized um, <laughs> kind, of, kind of pieces of artwork there. So I'm just looking at Leo, and he just looks, he looks so much like that. He looks so stylized. So maybe that's what they were going for. I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure. And even the word taxidermy wasn't widely used until 1803. It's often credited to Louis Dufresne, who is an amazing old-timey taxidermist you all should look up. Um, and taxidermy is really part of this large, complex system of research and entertainment, um, and even outside of the unintentional entertainment that something like Leo provides for Leo. Um, but the taxidermists through history, all we really have left is their handiwork, unless they were notorious enough to make it into, to make it into the history books. All we really have left to go by about their character is their handiwork. Um, but with that, I still think Leo is a really remarkable specimen. 
He's 200 years old, and I'm not sure any of us would look this great at 200 years old. I mean, he's missing a little fur. He might have a crack or two in that plaster tongue, but he's pretty sturdy for his age. Um, he isn't crumbling, and even though the work wasn't good, it lasted. And that, you know, that says something to, if not to the craftsmanship, to the um, to the care that was taken of him afterwards. Because even the most well done taxidermy can deteriorate pretty badly. So this is a specimen that was um, over 100 years old. Um, you can see this tiger has, you know, it's gone through restoration, but the initial result, half the age of Leo, hasn't held up as well. Um, so it can really, you know, it can really go wrong. And Leo's value as taxidermy, as a meme, as a pop culture icon, it kind of lies in this ephemeral state of capturing what's long gone. Um, and what will never be, and kind of dulling the pain with laughter, which is something we all are probably doing right now. And I wonder about the life that Majestic Leo didn't ask for at this royal park. I wonder about the artists that were tasked with this labor-intensive work of immortalizing this beast that they've never seen before. And I wonder if they knew that we would even be talking about him tonight in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I wonder if they knew how horribly wrong all of it could really go. So Leo might not have asked for any of this. We might not have asked for any of this. But here we are, and let's drink to that. <laughs> Cheers.